Good morning, Madam Registrar. Could you call the case, please? Good morning, Your Honours. This is the case number IT0588T, the prosecutor versus Papo Itero. I thank you, Madam, and good morning to you once more. Uh, Mr. Popovic, can you follow the proceedings uh, in a language that you can understand? Well. Yes, I can. Oh, and good morning to you. Mr. Beara, well. can you follow the proceedings in uh, your own language? Yes, I can. Mr. Nikolic, can you follow the proceedings in your own language? Mog. Yes, I can. Mr. Borovchanin, same question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miletic, same question. I'm not receiving interpretation. Yes, I can, but I'm not receiving interpretation. I'll repeat uh, the same question to you. Uh, are you receiving interpretation now? Yes, uh, I, I am. I thank you. And uh, can you follow the proceedings in your own language, in other words? Yes, I can. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Guevero, same question to you. Mogu. I can. I thank you. And uh, Mr. Pandurovic. Good morning, Your Honor. Yes, I can. Thank you. I thank you all and good morning to you all. Appearances for the prosecution. Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honors. My name is Peter McCloskey. Together with me today is Madam Prosecutor Carla Del Ponte and the attorneys from the Srebrenica Jeppa trial team, Julian Nichols, Nelson Thayer, and Vlada Sholyan. Okay, I thank you, uh, Mr. McCloskey, and good morning to you. Uh, to you as well, Madam Del Ponte and the rest of the team. Appearances for Vyadin Popovic. Your Honor, for Vyadin Popovic, Zoran Zivanovic, lead counsel, Julie Pando, co counsel, and Case manager. I thank you, Mr. Zivanovic, and good morning to you and your team. Appearances for Ljubiza Beara. Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honors. My name is John Ostojic. I'm here with my team members, Mr. Chris Meek and Mr. Nebojša Merkic, <coughs> on behalf of Ljubiša Beara. I thank you, Mr. Ostojic, and good morning to you and your team. Appearances for Drago Nikolic. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Jelena Nikolic, and together with Mr. Stefan Bogon and Bojan Stefanovic, our case manager, we represent Mr. Drago Nikolic. Hey, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Nikolic, and good morning to you and your team. Appearances for accused Lyubomir Borov Chanin. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Alexander Lazarevic. By my side is Mr. Miodrag Stojanic and Ms. Tatiana Cneric. We will represent Mr. Borov Chanin. I thank you, Mr. Lazarevic, and good morning to you and your team. Uh, appearances for Radivoje Miletic. Good morning, Your Honours. I'm Natasha Fubo Ivanovic, and I represent Radivoje Miletic uh, together with my assistant, Mr. Nikolic. I thank you, uh, Madam Ivanovic, and good morning to you and your team. Um, uh, uh, Milan Gvero. Your Honours, uh, Dragan Kirgovic and Natalie Wagner for John Aguero. I thank you, Mr. Kirgovic, and good morning to you and your team. And uh, finally, appearances for Vinko Pandurovic. Uh, Your Honour, I, Peter Haynes, appear together with uh, Mr. George Sarapa for Vinko Pandurovic. We're assisted in court today by our case manager, Helena Kaka. I thank you, and good morning to you and your team, Mr. Haynes. So, um, before we uh, move ahead with uh, the opening uh, statement of the prosecution. Are there any preliminaries? Yes, Madame Favot. Monsieur le Président, je Your Honour, I would just like to draw your attention to the fact that the accused have not received uh, the operative indi indictment which was filed on the 4th of uh, August 2006 in BCS. 
What about the other accused? In other words, is uh, yours uh, an exception, or, or uh, does, uh, does, does it apply to uh, each and every one of the accused? Yeah, Mr. I, I see Mr. Kirgovich, Mr. Zivanovich, uh, Mr. Ostojic, uh, and Mr. Nikolic, and Mr. Lazarevich. So, um, uh, Madam Registrar, what's, what's the problem? Why haven't uh, they received a copy of the operative indictment in their own language? Yes, it's been a um, translation process. Um, I will find out and I will back to you. All right. We'll work on it, um, uh, <coughs> Madame Favot and the other council. And we'll see to it that uh, it is distributed without uh, any undue delay. Uh, any further um, uh, preliminary matters? Yes, Mr. Bougon. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, judges. Uh, Mr. President, I would like uh, at this time and before we proceed with the opening statement of the prosecutor, prosecution, uh, to uh, present a oral joint motion for reconsideration of the decision issued by the trial chamber on Friday, the 18th of August, 2006. We are of the view, Mr. President, on behalf of all seven accused in this trial, that this motion must be heard before we uh, proceed with the prosecution's opening statement for a number of reasons, including the fact that the motion, of course, deals with all seven accused in this case. Secondly, the motion concerns the proceedings as a whole, as well as the fairness of the proceedings. One, one moment, Mr. Bourgogne. If you're going to make uh, submissions, uh, we'll give you a time uh, limit within which to uh, make your submissions. Uh, we'll give equal time to the prosecution to reply, and we will hand down our oral decision uh, soon after, as soon as practical and then we can uh, start. But if you're going to make submissions, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Your President. Honor. I will get straight to the point. Your Honor, may I be heard? Yes, certainly. Um, this matter has been decided on in a written, in an oral, excuse me, in a written decision. And uh, we object, especially at this time, at this critical time, to any delay. If, if this matter, if you think it should be discussed in court, I would request that any discussion be made at the end of the trial day and that we um, allow the prosecutor to make her statement and, and that I make begin my statement and then we handle this later. But this matter has been dealt with. Yes, but there is, a, uh, there, there is an intimation that uh, the uh, joint uh, defense teams would like to have the matter reconsidered. So let's hear what they have to say. You will be given every opportunity to uh, reply, and then we'll hand down uh, our decision uh, soon after or as soon as practical. But I can assure you the matter will be dealt with uh, in a final manner um, uh, this morning, within the next 20 minutes or so. Yes, Mr. Bougou. Thank you, Mr. President. As please, mentioned, please with five minutes. Please restrict yourself to uh, any submissions which are uh, new uh, and uh, not, uh, not, not, not uh, those that we have already decided upon. Will do, Thank Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. President, the uh, legal basis for this motion is the Appeals Chamber decision of June 2006 in the Zigic case, saying that a trial chamber may and has the power to reconsider its decision on the basis of either a change of circumstances or on the basis that the decision is erroneous and has caused a prejudice to the defense. All defense attorneys in this case, Mr. President, believe that both of the, lay of the aspects of this test are met in this case. Moving straight away to the situation of a change of circumstances. In the decision, the trial chamber said, recognized that the prosecution had not fulfilled entirely its disclosure obligation However, it did recognize that, or maybe it was not satisfied, that the partial non-disclosure by the prosecution has denied the defense the ability to prepare adequately for trial. The order said we will, the prosecution is to comply without delay with its disclosure obligation pursuant to Rule 65 ter 
ECHO 3I, and the prosecution is to provide the defense before or by the commencement of trial proceedings with a, an update of its witnesses for August and September, <coughs> which shall include a list of exhibits uh, to be used with each. Under the heading, Change in Circumstances, I respectfully submit on behalf of all the accused the following. <laughs> Firstly, the prosecution has not provided the defense, as it was ordered to do, a revised list of witnesses for August and September, along with a list of exhibits to be used. Secondly, the prosecution has not provided the defense since the decision with any further disclosure of exhibits that it intends to offer at trial. Thirdly, the prosecution has failed, as ordered by the trial chamber on 30 June, to file its proofing chart for all witnesses in this case by 18 August 2006, last Friday, as it was ordered to do. Fourthly, on 18 August, the prosecution filed a new motion, a new motion for three additional witnesses as well as 360 new documents to be added in this case. For sure, Mr. President, the prosecution knew when it responded to the defense motion that it was about to file 360 new documents and ask for three more witnesses. For sure, Mr. President, the prosecution knew that it would not be able to file its proofing chart by Friday when it responded to the defense motion. Fifthly, Mr. President, the defense still has not received a full index indicating the material that is necessary or that is relevant for each of the witnesses in this case. Meaning that for each witness, we have consistently been asking the prosecution to provide us with what is the material? Statements, interviews, prior testimonies, information reports, and any documents which may have been provided by each of the witnesses. This information, Mr. President, is required at this time and it has not yet been provided. It is not for the defense to look for this information, it is for the prosecution to provide this information. Sixthly, Mr. President, the, the defense has not yet received the information requested in order to make the prosecution pretrial brief a meaningful document. This was brought to the attention of the prosecution in both some of the pretrial briefs filed by the defense, as well as on 14 July during the pro forma beginning of this trial. We believe, Mr. President, that all of this is a change of circumstances <coughs> that warrant a reconsideration of the motion. Under the heading prejudice to the defense, well, I will make it short and simply address two categories which need further emphasis, namely the issue of the intercept material. 150 at least intercept material which have not yet been provided to the defense in English. This material, Mr. President, for sure, must have been reviewed and analyzed by the prosecution at some point, and in addition, it must have been reviewed by the lead trial attorney from the prosecution. The prosecution cannot deny that this material is important for its case, yet the defense does not have it in English in order to prepare for this trial. Secondly, Mr. President, the issue of the operational logs. Both of these issues were addressed in our motion and we are under the, uh, we respectfully, respectfully submit that they have not been uh, addressed sufficiently or considered in rendering the decision. These operational logs is a tool that will be absolutely required by both the defense and the trial chamber alike with a view to being able to understand better these witnesses. Looking at the prejudice, Mr. President, when we look at the missing material, when we look at the missing translations, when we look at the fact that we do not have the proofing chart ordered for 18 August, that we do not have a proper pretrial brief, that we do not have an updated witness list, that we do not have a list of material for each witness. This, Mr. President, has hampered defense preparations to a point where it is necessary to postpone the proceedings in this case. Now, we opened up in terms of our last submission, which was our reply. We said we will proceed this week with those two first witnesses. <coughs> we will proceed with, those, uh, with the opening statements if that is the wish of the trial chamber. However, before any further uh, meaningful or 
witnesses which address a lot of exhibit testify before this chamber. Uh, they should, Mr. President, at least 10 days before we get all the material and the testimony of the first such witness. I have, this is uh, my five minutes. I would have much more to say, but in a gist, this is what the, on behalf of all seven accused in this case, we believe that there is a prejudice to the defense and that there is a need to postpone the proceedings in this case, maybe not for long, but what is important is the prosecution must be in a position or must be, uh, in a, must have a way to fulfill its obligation so that we can have this trial started on a firm and sound basis. Okay. Thank I, you, Mr. President, I on thank behalf you. of all accused in this case. I thank you, Mr. Bourbon, also for uh, st staying within the time uh, limit. Mr. McCloskey, you have five minutes. Mr. President, uh, first of all, having this uh, thrown at me like this, I've tried to keep track of what he's saying, but it's, it's difficult because when <laughs> He says that the, he hasn't received the proofing chart. The proofing chart has been filed. Um, and so I don't know what the, the problem is, and I don't know what else uh, is a problem that really is not in, in what he said, because the proofing chart is filed. The updated exhibit and witness list, we have a stack right here ready to give to them. I had thought it had been given electronically, so I had asked my co-counsel not to pass it out right at the end of the hour. Um, apparently it's not been sent electronically, but we have it, so it's here. The other matter, um, the over 300 um, new documents. Well, that's the subject matter of um, an outstanding motion. Uh, I mean, if, if you deal with it uh, um, uh, very briefly, uh, in the same way it has uh, been uh, uh, submitted or along the same lines it has been made reference to by uh, Mr. Bourgon. Okay, otherwise please uh, go on to the next point. I mean, the, the idea is that uh, this should, uh, the fact that there is this outstanding motion in itself should delay the uh, commencement of the, of the case. Uh, do you agree to that? Yes, I, th I think that makes sense. If I could just okay. mention, so y your Honor is aware that why there's uh, 300 some odd new exhibits, very briefly. Um, the, the Militic um, trial brief um, surprised us in, in where he denied any involvement in providing humanitarian aid. We had over 200 documents with his name on it. They're pro forma convoy type documents, not all of which have been translated. So at an abundance of caution in response to the pre-trial brief, we've got those to the defense as soon as we could. They're not all translated. So many of these documents are in response to pretrial brief issues that we now are um, under, understand will be contested at trial. Um, we've tried to avoid dumping enormous numbers of documents on the defense at early on in the exhibit uh, list. And um, so we will hope to be adding as, as issues come up, not in a huge bulk. Um, Frankly, the other issues he mentioned, the intercepts, um, the logs, I, I could discuss those at length, uh, but we've discussed those in our brief. There, there's no need to, um, uh, for the, especially for the logs, to, to translate all the information in all the logs. We've translated them to the part that is most relevant. The intercepts, we're doing our best to, uh, to um, translate as, as quick as we can, and uh, we've left the some 100, 150 as potentially relevant intercepts, and I hope to perhaps cut off some of those intercepts as I get the translations. But our analysts said they appeared relevant, so out of an abundance of caution, we've put those on our list, and that's, that's the, the group we're talking about. I don't have any English translation that we're holding back. How, how soon will you be making use, or you do you anticipate you'll be making use of uh, any of these intercept uh, or operational locks with witnesses? Months and months. All right, okay, go ahead. The end of our, the, the guts of this case, the documents and the intercepts, it comes at the end of the case. And um, I think we've all tried to examine how long this will take, but probably not between six and nine months down the road. All right, okay. Yes, um, uh, anything else? I think that's the most of it, Your Honor. Okay, I right, thank you. 
So we'll uh, have uh, a very short break, uh, three minutes, four minutes maximum, um, uh, and we'll come back with, uh, with a decision. Yes, I see uh, both Mr. Bougon and uh, Madame Favreau. Mr. Bougon. Mr. President, if I can have, please, with your permission, uh, one minute to apply. Yes, go There ahead. has been no proofing chart file. The proofing chart, there is a proofing chart filed back in July, but there was one segment for 18th of August which has not been filed unless it was filed after hours on Friday, but we even checked with court management this morning. It has not been filed. The Militage document deals with the main staff. This is joint criminal enterprise case. All accused in this case must review these documents. All we hear from the prosecution is inadvertently, abundance of caution, 11th hour, avoiding dumping. It's a matter, Mr. President, of what message the trial chamber wants to send to the uh, justice community to the judicial community in terms of can we start this trial on a firm basis or do we just say time is the only thing that matters, prosecution, you can do what you want, doesn't matter as long as we get this trial going. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you, Mr. Bourgon, Madame Favreau. Monsieur le Président, je serai très rapide. Your Honor, I would be very grateful to the prosecution if it could uh, quote uh, the brief I have filed because the terms used by the cr prosecutor are not quite the terms which we used in our pretrial brief. I thank you. Do you have any further comments, Mr. McCloskey, before we retire for, for our deliberations? No, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Kirgovic. <coughs> Your Honor, there is a set of documents that have just been submitted that apply to my client among the 360. Uh, I'm not talking about documents that apply only to general military. There are other documents that apply to other accused as well. Uh, 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 from my experience here over the last five years, that is something that continues, uh, goes on and on and on throughout uh, the entire trial. Documents keep arriving as uh, they, they come to the surface. And uh, we usually intervene when we uh, are convinced that uh, you need time to go through them before before you can uh, proceed with the case. But let's see whether that's the case now. We'll retire for a few minutes. We'll come back with our oral decision. Thank you. All right, very full of it. Please be seated. So uh, the trial chamber is seized of a joint uh, defense motion uh, made this morning for reconsideration of its uh, decision filed last Friday uh, on another uh, joint uh, defense uh, motion for postponement of the commencement of uh, the trial. Uh, this is our oral uh, decision. Uh, we have heard uh, oral submissions by parties. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, confirmed that the uh, uh, the proofing chart that was uh, expected to be filed by uh, last Friday was indeed uh, filed, although it seems uh, it has not been uh, distributed. Uh, we consider the submission uh, relating to the prosecution request to add three witnesses and about 360 uh, fresh uh, exhibits 
uh, to uh, be uh, the subject matter of an outstanding motion and uh, should be dealt with as such in that uh, motion and not as a reason for delaying the uh, commencement of or the, the, the for uh, postponing the, the commencement of, uh, of the trial. Uh, equally, we have uh, heard confirmation from the prosecution that the intercept uh, material and operational logs uh, will be made uh, use of with witnesses at a much uh, later stage in the proceedings. We do not consider any of the other uh, so-called fresh uh, circumstances uh, mentioned uh, this morning by Mr. Bougon and others, uh, such as to warrant a postponement in the commencement of uh, the trial. Consequently, we stand by our decision uh, of last uh, Friday, which denied the uh, uh, joint defense uh, motion for postponement, uh, for postponement of the commencement of proceedings. And we ordered that the uh, proceedings in this trial be proceeded with uh, forthwith. Thank you. Uh, any further um, uh, preliminary matters? I hear none. Uh, so, Madame Del Ponte, I take it uh, you wanted the floor first before, before Mr. McCloskey. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor, Mr. President. Yes, indeed, I would like to make a few brief opening remarks before Senior Trial Attorney Peter McCloskey addresses you. For those of us Gazer is here today, over a decade and nearly 2,000 kilometers removed from the events of Srebrenica in July 1995. It is difficult, if not impossible, to comprehend the scale of the horror inflicted on the inhabitants of the Srebrenica enclave. Words cannot convey the magnitude of, of the crimes committed and the suffering endured by the victims. For the survivors, the wounds have not yet healed and the suffering continues. For many of them, it still feels like only yesterday that they were forcibly separated from their families and so their loved ones taken away by armed soldiers, never to see them again. In most cases, never to learn what finally happened to them. Before the war, Srebrenica was known mainly for the local mining industry and for its health spas. The town was not particularly well known outside of the former Yugoslavia. In 1991, the population was approximately 75% Muslim. Now, now, the name of Srebrenica is infamous. Srebrenica is invariably associated with the most heinous of crimes, forcible transfer, mass murder, and genocide. It is beyond reasonable dispute that genocide and other crimes against humanity were committed in Srebrenica in July 1995. These terrible facts have been proven have been proven in other trials held before this tribunal. The facts of the forcible transfer of the population and the mass executions have also been painstakingly established by investigations and reports of the United Nations Human Rights Organization and government. As just one example, let me read you a portion of the concluding paragraph of the 15 November 1999 report of the Secretary General pursuant to General Assembly Resolution 5335. The fall of Srebrenica, and I quote, the body of this report sets out in meticulous systematics, exhaustive and ultimately harrowing detail the descent of Srebrenica <coughs> into a horror without parallel in the history of Europe since the Second World War. I urge all concerned to study this report carefully and to let the facts speak for themselves. 
the men who have been charged with these crimes against humanity reminded the world, and in particular the United Nations, that evil exists in the world." Unquote. Your Honours, the facts do indeed speak for themselves. Let me quickly discuss some of the key facts which are before and will be proven beyond reasonable doubt in this trial. In July 1995, the Bosnian Serb Army, or VRS, implemented the final phase of a comprehensive criminal plan to permanently erase the Muslim population of Srebrenica. As is well known, the enclave fell to the VRS on 11 July 1995 after a brief military campaign. Within three days, in an atmosphere of utter terror, tens of thousands of citizens, women, children, and the elderly were forcibly removed from the enclave by the VRS and Bosnian Serb police forces. What little the victims could carry, they brought with them in bundles as they were loaded into overcrowded buses in the village of Potocari near Srebrenica. The separation of Potocari was captured by a Serb cameraman. And you will see scenes of these poor, terrified people being forced forth from their homes. You will hear first-hand evidence of the fact that the men and boys gathered in Potocari were prevented by armed soldiers from entering the buses with their families. Instead, they were separated from their wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters. These men and boys, aged approximately 15 to 78, faced a far grimmer fate. After being separated from their families, they were confined in cramped detention facilities under brutal conditions. Their meager belongings were taken away from them, piled up and burned. In the following weeks, VRS and police forces systematically murdered over 7,000 Muslim men and boys from the Srebrenica enclave. The victims included those separated from their families in Potocari, as well as thousands of men and boys who either surrendered or were captured as they tried to flee the enclave. These victims, civilians, as well as soldiers who had set down their arms, were detained, murdered in firing squads, and bulldozed into mass graves. Where are the victims of these mass executions today? Most of them remain together in mass primary or secondary gra graves, hidden in the woods and buried beneath the fields. They lie together, many of them undoubtedly still bound by wire and blindfolds. For the evidence shows that many victims were bound with ligatures and blindfolded in order to make the murder easier for the executions. These were not, not deaths sustained, as it has been argued, in combat. And that is what this case is about, your honors. An entire population erased. Women, children, and the elderly forced from their homes. Defenseless men and boys executed by firing squad, buried in mass graves, and then dug up and buried once again in an effort to conceal the truth from the world. But the lasting tragedy of Srebrenica, the living legacy of this atrocity, is with the families left behind. The women and children forced to leave their lives deprived of their fathers without their husbands, their brothers, their sons, their neighbors, the community gone. The continuing impact of these crimes on the Muslims' population of Srebrenica was evident most recently, at the ceremony last month in Potocari commemorating the 11th anniversary of the fall of Srebrenica. 
Thousands of mourners, mainly women, gathered there for the burial of still more victims at the memorial center. At the ceremony, over 500 more victims of genocide were buried. They joined some 2,000 other victims in the ground of the cemetery at the memorial center. However, <clears throat> all too many victims still await a proper burial. To date, over 3,000 victims have been exhumed by the Office of the Prosecutor and the international community. They are stored anonymously in morgues, <coughs> bearing tags, waiting for identification that in many cases may never be realized. For some of the survivors, a minority, there is at least the sense of certainty that comes when a missing loved one is finally found and identified. However, for far too many of the survivors, there is not even this small measure of relief. The questions remain, what happened to my father, my husband, my son? Why was he killed? Where is he? What were his last moments like? Why did this happen to us? Let me read you something said by one survivor, witness DD, in previous Srebrenica trial about the loss of a child and how she still felt the pain years after he was taken from her in Potocari, and he remains among the missing. I quote, as a mother, I still have hope. I just can't believe that this is true. How is it possible that a human being could do something like this, could destroy everything, could kill so many people? Just imagine this youngest boy I had, those little hands of his, how could they be dead? I imagine those hands picking strawberries, reading books, going to school, going on excursions, Every morning I wake up, I cover my eyes not to look at other children going to school and husbands going to work holding hands." Unquote. The pain expressed in those words is felt by every survivor who still waits to learn the fate of a loved one. Justice, your honors. The ceremony of Potocari was, of course, a ceremony of loss and grief, but it was also a ceremony of hope. Hope for justice. And with justice, the hope for reconciliation between peoples. With justice comes the hope for a lasting peace. The surviving victims of these crimes yearn for justice, justice not revenge. There is a passage which the Grand Mufti of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mustafa Efendia Cheric, often state in his prayers and appeals to people to remember the crimes of Srebrenica and pray that they shall never be perpetrated again against any people. I would like to repeat it to you. Revenge is not a Bosnian tradition. Revenge is not a Bosnian measure. The truth is our belief and justice is our destiny. This trial is the next phase in bringing to justice those men most responsible for all of the crimes against humanity committed in Srebrenica and uh, Jepa. There have been other trials concerned with the crimes in Srebrenica. These trials have exposed the truth and punished some of the guilty, but all of those individuals most responsible for this genocide and indeed the other crimes committed in Srebrenica have not yet been brought to justice. This trial is an important step towards that goal. These seven accused, your honors, officers serving below Ratko Mladic and Ratko Tolimir are among those most responsible, most responsible for the terrible crimes committed in Srebrenica are set forth in the indictment. 
the crimes that are the subject of this indictment in this case were committed with brutality, boldness, and impunity in equal measure. The separation of the women and children from the men and boys in Potocha <coughs> and their forcible expulsion while the men and boys were detained awaiting execution took place in front of rolling television cameras. It was broadcast around the world as the crimes occurred. And of course, you will see much of this video evidence during the course <coughs> of the trial. It is right to recall, as we start this trial, that the ICTY was created in the face of continued and serious violation of international humanitarian law in the former Yugoslavia. This judicial institution is a product of one of the most important measures taken by the Security Council, acting for all member states of the United Nations to restore and maintain international peace and security. That is our collective mission, our responsibility, and our contribution to peace and security, to bring to justice those individuals responsible for the most serious crimes known to humanity. The crimes that are the subject of this trial, genocide, the crimes against humanity, and violations of the laws or customs of war are set forth in the indictment. And indeed, all the crimes within the jurisdiction of the tribunals are crimes of such a magnitude that they endure us all. These crimes are offenses against the victims and all of humankind because they are of a scale that offend our deepest principle of human rights and human dignity. The trials before this tribunal have proven that international law is not merely theory nor an abstract concept. International law is and must be a fully functioning system to protect our values and regulate behavior in civilized society. To achieve this goal, crime which shocks the consciousness of humanity, crimes against us all cannot be permitted to go unpunished. I bring these accused before your honors to face the charges against them. I do so on behalf of the international community and in the name of all the member states of the United Nations. And as with all accused in this tribunal, they are brought before you to be tried for their individual criminal responsibility. No state, no nationality, no organization is on trial for these crimes. Crimes are committed by individual people. And individual people must be held responsible for their criminal acts. There is no such thing as collective guilt before this tribunal. The case against these accused will be difficult and will take time. The very number of accused in this case will invariably result in challenges for the prosecution, your honors, and the defense. However, I know that each of the accused will receive a fair trial in accordance with the highest standard of international justice there can be no justice without the utmost respect for the rights of the accused. And I'm certain that this trial will reflect the absolute commitment of the Office of the Prosecutor to upholding the rights of the accused, as well as those of the victims and witnesses. As I said earlier, the surviving victims of the Srebrenica crimes yearned for justice, not vengeance. They look towards this tribunal to provide justice, to prove the truth of what happened to them, and to convict the guilty. This trial is an important step towards and a cause for hope. However, at the commencement of this trial, we must also acknowledge with regret that the effort 
to bring to justice the most responsible for the terrible crimes in the former Yugoslavia, including the darkest chapter, the genocide in Srebrenica, is incomplete. And fortunately, two men who should be sitting as accused before your honors right now in this courtroom are still at large. I refer, of course, to Ratko Mladic and Zdravko Tolimir. It is absolutely scandalous that these men, along with Rad Radovan Karadzic, have not been arrested and delivered to the tribunal to face the charges brought against them. The government of the Republic of Serbia is fully capable of arresting these men. It has simply, until now, refused to do so. Tolimir was, as you know, indicted and joined to the accused in the case before you today. Now, because of the refusal of Serbia to arrest him, his case must be severed from the indictment. Mladic, Mladic should be on trial in this case. It was always hoped and indeed expected that he would be delivered to the tribunal in time to have his case joined to this trial. Again, the inexcusable refusal to arrest and transfer Mladic means that another Srebrenica trial must be held in the future, when Mladic and Tolimir will be in custody. And to make no mistake, he, Mladic, Tolimir, Karadzic, and all the remaining fugitives will be arrested. They will be brought to The Hague, and they will be tried to the crimes. This is our pledge to the international community, to the women who mourned for their loss in Potocari, and to all victims of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. Your Honours, Mr. President, I have said what I came before you to say. I have absolute confidence that you will conduct this trial with fairness to all parties and reach a just verdict. With your authorization, I give the floor now to Senior Trial Attorney Peter McCloskey. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you, Madame Del Ponte, Mr. McCloskey. Um, we'll have a break at 10.30. Thank you. Thank you. President, your honors. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here before you today to give you my opening statement. In 1992, Karadzic and Mladic had a plan for an ethnically pure Bosnian state. For over three years, their plan was brutally executed on a massive scale by intimidation, terror, Excuse me, if, if I could ask the discussion. This campaign began with the war in the spring of 1992 and continued throughout the conflict, culminating in the removal of the Muslim population from eastern Bosnia in July 1995 and the Srebrenica genocide. Karadzic and Mladic relied upon a few close associates and a political and military system perverted to carry out their war against the Muslim and Croatian armies and the Muslim and Croatian people of Bosnia. I'm not suggesting that the conduct of the entire war was criminal, but in eastern Bosnia and elsewhere, each of the major military endeavors had two objectives. First, beat the enemy. Fair enough, that's war. Second, move out the Muslim population. That is the 
crime that brought us here. The officers involved cannot separate themselves from this simple truth. To get the job done, Mladic relied upon Generals Milovanovic, Militic, Vero, and Tolomir. There were other generals in his main staff, but none of them were as close to Mladic and therefore not as powerful as these four men. The main staff knew the horrors of forcing a people to leave their homeland, and yet they all did their part to achieve it. It is unthinkable that in July 1995, any general in the main staff had not become fully involved in Mladic's campaign to remove the Muslim population from eastern Bosnia. The facts of this case will make this abundantly clear. In 1995, General Mladic and his main staff looked to their corps and brigade commanders to command the troops in defeating the enemy and removing the Muslim population from their homes. For the Srebrenica genocide and the movement of the Muslim population, General Mladic and his main staff relied principally on General Kerstic. As you're aware, General Kerstic stands convicted by this court of aiding and abetting genocide. In turn, the main staff and General Kerstic relied upon Colonel Venko Pandorovic, Vidoye Blagojevic, Major Dragan Obrenovic, Lubivir Borovchanin, and other commanders to defeat the Muslim forces remove the Muslim population. I'll slow down. And murder the able-bodied men of Srebrenica. Major Obrenovic has pled guilty in this court for doing just that. Main staff units such as the 10th Sabotage Detachment assisted in this awful process. 10th Sabotage Soldier, Drajan Rdemovic, has pled guilty to his involvement in these crimes. The majority of the work in supervising, organizing, coordinating, and facilitating the actual removal of the Muslim population from Srebrenica and Jepa, and the murder of the able-bodied men from Srebrenica fell to the security officers. For the main staff, Colonel Yuluvio Beata. For the command of the Drina Corps, Lieutenant Colonel Vojidin Popovic. For the command of the Bratunats Brigade, Captain Momir Nikolic. For the command of the Zvornik Brigade, Lieutenant Drago Nikolic. And his associate and assistant, Milorad Turbic. Momir Nikolic has pled guilty to these crimes. For Jeppa, General Tolomir himself was assigned by Mladic to present and be involved in the attack on Jeppa and the removal of its Muslim population. He was assisted in this briefly by Ibero, Pandurovic, and security officers Beata and Popovic, and others. We will begin the prosecution by bringing into court a few of the amazing men and boys that survived the mass executions. Without them, the heart of this story cannot be told. We will move on to the former chief of the Srebrenica investigation, Jean-René Ruiz, then to the Dutch battalion soldiers, experts, Bosnian Serb witnesses, and actual video footage. And finally, ending with a discussion of the guts of this case, the Lincolns. <coughs> None of us will be left untouched by this trial. It will likely be the most important case we will ever try. But the focus of the prosecution will not be the events and the crime days. These crimes are etched into the terrible history of the Bosnian War. The crimes have never been in serious dispute. We will therefore focus this case on the evidence linking these accused to these crimes. The linkage evidence will come largely from three main sources. The first being documents. Most criminal orders in wartime are given orally, 
and most of the important relevant military and MOOP documents have been destroyed or hidden. However, there are some crucial VRS and MOOP documents that will help expose this crime and each of the accused in this courtroom. Number two, intercepts. You will also see the text of radio intercepts taken down by the Muslim army as they eavesdropped on the VRS and MOOP conversations. You will hear all about the process used by the BIH army and I'm confident you'll find this evidence reliable and credible. And they should form an important part of your judgment. Now, you will not be hearing audio of these conversations. Audio does not exist for the vast majority of them. What you will see are transcripts, and you'll hear about the process where the Muslim operators listened carefully to conversations, and when they heard a conversation, they started taping it. And they would usually get it right in the beginning. They would tape several conversations like this, go to a side room, and carefully transcribe that tape and listen to it over and over again until they had the transcription written down. Then that would be saved in handwritten notebooks and then sent out over their intelligence email network and saved in transcripts. And the tapes were used over and over again. They didn't have enough tapes. This will be evidence that will be very important for this case. And of course, testimony. Now, some over 10 years after these events, there's many more people, many more Serbs that are willing to talk about the events. Many of the VRS and MOOP witnesses will directly implicate one or more of the accused of the crime. As you see at the end of our witness list, long lists of <coughs> VRS and MOOP people, each of these are on that list because they go to the acts or conduct of the accused. But a word of caution here. Many of these witnesses will be adverse witnesses. Many of these witnesses will not be telling you the full truth. Many of the witnesses will go back and forth. However, with your knowledge of the case and your experience, I'm confident that you will be able to glean the truth from these witnesses. And in fact, even in lies, you can find the truth. Let me give you one example. You'll be hearing from one MOOP supervisor under the command of Mr. Borotinen. He will acknowledge that he was in Podachari. He will acknowledge he was under the command of Borovchen, and he will lay out the command structure and largely the locations of where the, his troops were situated. This is extremely valuable information for all of us. Yet at the same time, he will largely look at you from this chair and say that he never saw anybody separated in Potichari, even though he was there for two days. Now, I think there is something to be had from this witness, even though he's a bold-faced liar, and I think we glean something from his bold-faced lie. Why can't he tell about the separations? Well, simply, it was a crime. <laughs> All right. I want to talk a little bit about the charges. Despite a massive indictment that got bigger and bigger, I try to break the basic indictment down into basically the, the two horrendous crimes that the prosecutor mentioned. The forced movement of the Muslim population and the misery and death resulting from that, and two, the mass murder of the thousands of Bosnian Muslim men and boys. Put these together, you get genocide. Now, it's important to point out and something that you know, but that I, is, is a continuing theme with the witnesses especially, is that forced movement is not just about moving the people out. That when done with the knowledge that this is the eventual aim, 
It involves, one, strangling the enclaves by limiting the crucial supplies. Two, terrorizing the civilian population by sniping and shelling. Three, attacking the civilian population during the assault on the enclaves. And four, moving them out on buses and trucks or scaring them out by foot, boat, and as you'll see, wheelbarrows attached to logs. Substantial involvement in any one or combination of these with the knowledge of the overall plan to remove the population, in our view, makes an accused criminally responsible. In addition, as set out clearly in the indictment, substantial involvement in an otherwise legal act with the knowledge that such action substantially assists the criminal objective and the intent to do so also makes an accused criminally liable. This is especially true at the high level we're talking about, Generals Cabero and Militich. For example, when Cabero and Militich, as part of the overall plan to remove the Muslim population, take part in defeating Unprofor with the aim to getting at the population. That makes them guilty because they're part, it's an overall part and an integral connected link to the overall criminal objective. Now, the attack on the enclave may not have to be completely illegal, as we'll get into later. Clearly, the Muslims were creating a situation that would have allowed the Serbs to attack them and attack the, the Muslim army. But that does not justify an attack directed towards civilian targets with the overall additional objective to move out the Muslim population. Mass murder. It's crucial to understand that genocide and mass murder is much more than just an order from Karadzic and Mladic and then the people on the ground shooting. This is something that I'm, I'm sure the judges understand, but you'll see from the witnesses that, that in, they pretend they don't in many respects. When committed with the knowledge that victims would be killed, the commission of mass murder involves all of the following in equal measure talking about mass murder as developed in Europe at the end of this century. It involves this, capturing the Muslim men, detaining the men, transporting the men to detention sites, detaining the men in pre-execution detention sites, transporting the men to the execution sites executing the men, <coughs> and disposing of the men. This is the crime of mass murder. We are all familiar with the crime of drugs and the crime of bank robbery and the other crimes, and we know how those work. But when someone takes part in any of these activities, knowing it's leading to the death and the murder of people, especially at the officer level, they are part of the program. Any person substantially participating in any of these activities must be found responsible. As a member of a joint criminal enterprise intending the outcome is one way, or as an aider and abetter who has knowledge of the crime and substantially assists in its commission. To drive home the point that these crimes are not just about shooters and Mladic or Karadzic or Milosevic, I want to read you the testimony of a young survivor from the Petkovsi Dam executions, Witness O from the Kerstich trial. He's also a young kid that remember the prosecutor's quote of the imam. This guy pulled himself out of beneath some thousand people, 500 to 1,000 people, and along with a colleague even though wounded, managed to survive in the woods and escape. And when he testified in the Kerstich trial, 
This is what he said. From all of whatever I have said and what I saw, I could come to the conclusion that this was extremely well organized. It was systematic killing, and that the organizers of that do not deserve to be at liberty. And if I had the right and the courage in the name of all those innocents and all those victims, I would forgive the actual perpetrators of the executions because they were misled. Witness O's organizers. They're in court today with us. That's the focus of this tribunal. That's the focus of this case. In order to understand Srebrenica and identify those responsible for the crimes, I've always divided this case into roughly three chapters. And I will spend the next few hours going over those chapters with you. The first chapter I call the, the history leading up to the attack on Srebrenica. It's important to understand the big picture, the historical background, the people, the places, and the events leading up to the attack on Srebrenica and Jeppe enclaves in July. 1995. And as part of the first chapter, I think we need to have a basic understanding of the makeup and organization of the Army and police forces involved. I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on that. I would refer you, when we get there, to the reports of Rick Butler and the various officers as they testify, VRS officers included. But I'll go over a few of the, what I think are the important issues that you should bear in mind from the beginning of the case. Chapter 2, the fall in Srebrenica and Jeppa. These are the events largely from 10 July through roughly 19 July, where the population <coughs> has moved out and the men and and boys were killed. Then chapter three is what I call direct linkage. And in that chapter, I will take documents and intercepts and some discussion of, of witnesses, but not many, and discuss each of the accused and, and show you those documents that when they finally do come into this case, will point at the, each of the accused and implicate the accused in a significant way. And I'll go over those with you at the end of my opening statement. I notice we have a break in five minutes. Um, before we get into chapter one, sh might be a good idea to, to take a break. Whenever it's convenient uh, for you, Mr. McLaughlin. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Now would be a convenient okay, time. Okay, that's perfect. So we'll have 20 minutes uh, from now. Thank you. All rise for a vote of it.